He's a biologist, author, and a lifelong animal advocate. He has three biology degrees, including a PhD in ethology from the University of Tennessee. He has published over 60 scientific papers on animal behavior and animal protection. And today he will present the lecture entitled, Most Eaten, Less Respected, The Rich Life of Fishes. Um, Thank you, Hanik, for that introduction. Uh, can everybody hear me? And if I'm here, can you still hear me? Okay, so I have a little bit of wandering room. Uh, thanks for coming to hear me today. It's great to be here. And um, I might signal to you. Great. We generally, and I don't usually hide behind lecterns, but um, the setup requires it. So I'm here I am. You, I'm a talking head. We generally view fishes through, we think of them as one of two main contexts, as a source of food and a source of recreation. Next slide. I'll go like that. How about that? Yeah, My own fishing career was quite brief. I soon lost interest when it came time to bait my own hooks with writhing earthworms and remove them from fishes' faces. I just couldn't help seeing it from their perspective. At that time, uh, 50 years ago, um, oh yes, I made no association between those fishes on my hook and the anonymous ones in that went into the filet fish sandwiches we had on regular visits to McDonald's. At that time, Mont McDonald's was boasting one billion served. They could just as soon have, they were referring to customers, of course, but they could just as soon have been referring to fishes or chickens for that matter. I also remember the stacks of anonymous tuna on the supermarket shelves, and having no idea what a tuna was, having no idea that a tuna is an apex predator who can swim faster than a tiger can run, can grow to 1,500 or more pounds. I remember seeing the dolphin safe tuna campaigns and wondering why there were no tuna safe tuna campaigns. Today, I want to invite you to see fishes through a different lens. I've spent the last five years swimming among, researching about, and writing about fishes, culminating in this book, What a Fish Knows. Sorry to say there are none left. I brought, I brought a massive number of five copies here, and I just uh, sold the last one, but uh, they're easily available online. So first, let me start with some superlatives. I'm going to tour you through just some highlights of what I've discovered about the lives of fishes. But first, I just want to entertain you with some superlatives that relate to these creatures. This is the reef trigger fish, known, uh, which probably has the longest fish name. It's known to the natives, the Hawaiian natives, as the humu humu nuku nuku apu a a. There won't be a quiz on that, so don't worry about that. Which apparently translates to the fish who sews with a needle and grunts like a pig. Uh, perhaps most preposterous fish name goes to the sarcastic fringe head, in my opinion. My nomination for the loveliest fish name, and perhaps the loveliest fish, is the diagonal banded sweet lips. Whenever I see one, I do want to give them a kiss. I don't know about you. Uh, I'm not in the mood to tell you the inadvertently rudest fish name. I just don't think maybe it's appropriate for this audience. Next slide. One of the smallest vertebrates goes to this little fish of Philippine freshwater lakes. You can put 400 of them onto one side of a scale and an American penny don't know what the equivalent of a Mexican coin <laughs> would be on the other side, and the coin will go down. So they're absolutely tiny. Thank you. You read my mind. The new record holder for, for longevity among vertebrates goes to the Greenland shark, a scientific study in which scientists requested the eyes from some incidentally caught sharks by fishermen. They can, you can measure the corneal layers on the eyes, just like you can measure the rings on a tree. And they, um, one of the females in that study had 392 corneal layers. So uh, she was approaching her 400th birthday at the time she was caught, apparently healthy, in fishermen's nets. So these are very, very long-lived creatures. My nomination for the kinkiest sex mating system goes to the deep-sea angler fishes. There's about 160 known species. They live in the largest livable habitat on Earth, the deep ocean, the abyss, beyond where the light can penetrate. 
it's very hard to find a mate down there of the right species. So if a male finds the right female and he can identify her maybe by smell, by the light flashing pattern that she does, he doesn't want to miss that opportunity. So he bites, he latches onto her, he bites into her, it doesn't really matter where, and he holds on and he stays there. It's the last bite he ever takes. And in time, his mouth fuses into her flesh and he shares her bloodstream and he can even, he can even, even inseminate her intravenously. Uh, next slide. Scientists call this sexual parasitism, and in the sense that she does all the hard work, provides the blood supply, he doesn't even take the garbage out or do the dishes, you might argue that um, it is a sort of a parasitic relationship. But considering that her reproductive life history would be a dead end if, if um, at least one male didn't find her, um, then it's maybe not such an unwelcome thing for her. Nevertheless, for any radical feminist in the audience, you may take some grim pleasure in the knowledge that some males only ever do amount to an appendage. All right, a little bit about fish minds and fish cognition. Next slide. This is an archer fish named for a barrel-shaped mouth, tube-shaped mouth through which they can squirt water uh, at high velocity. They can uh, squirt at about 10, uh, 10 feet at least, and they can aim accurately at insects perched near the water, or they can actually squirt water at insects flying by. And this does not become uh, come programmed in these fishes. They have to learn it. Careful studies, observational studies in captivity find that there's an apprenticeship time. And by watching uh, a naive young fish, watching other archer fish use this technique, they can go from not being able to do it at all to become quite good at it, despite having no personal experience themselves. So you might call that observational learning, which is generally regarded as a quite high level cognitive skill. They also are nuanced in how they the, the techniques that they use to catch insects who are flying by. So if the insect is flying by close to the water, they do a turn and shoot. So they will rotate the body. The fish will rotate the body and just squirt right at the, the prey, hoping to catch it if the prey doesn't deviate. But if the insect is further away, they use kind of the predictive tracking football pass type technique where they squirt ahead of the insect, hoping to, uh, to collide, coincide with where the insect is when the, bee, when the bolus of water gets there. They also, uh, careful slow motion filming studies show that they also control the size and shape of the bolus of water at the tip according to the size and speed of the prey. So it's very, very, it's not just a, a standardized type of technique, it's nuanced and um, probably involves a lot of cognition. Tool use used to be on a list that was just unique to humans, but now we know many animals have tool use. And fishes certainly qualify. This is a tusk fish, and you can watch YouTube videos of tusk fishes using water as a tool by blowing it onto the sand to uncover a mollusk, picking the mollusk up, and then swimming rather deliberately to presumably a predetermined location where there's a hunk of coral or a rock that the fish then, with a series of well-timed head releases, head flicks, and releases, is able to smash that unfortunate invertebrate against the rock to get at the soft tissue inside. You may also note the bystanders, or perhaps by swimmers, the other fishes nearby uh, waiting like scavengers for an opportunity. Fishes are very alert and aware of their surroundings, and they try to make the best of their situation. Studies have shown that fishes also fall for the same optical illusions that we do. This is the Ebbinghaus illusion, in which the two orange dots are the same size, but because of the arrangement of blue circles around them, the one on the right looks larger. If you train uh, a, a certain fish to choose the larger of two dots and then you present them with the Ebbinghaus solution, in this case they would swim up and poke their nose against the one on the right. And bamboo sharks and some other species also will register that they recognize a triangle in this case. This is the uh, Kinesa triangle. There's actually no triangle in the figure on the left, but we notice uh, a white triangle emerging from the image because of the shape of the black shapes around it. I think there's something um, poignant about fishes falling for an optical illusion. It suggests that they see the world in, in ways that we do. That it suggests that they can have beliefs and that they can be fallible. You probably heard of the infamous three-second goldfish memory. Well, this is a little fish of the, uh, of the Atlantic seaboard that really defies the, um, the poor memory uh, reputation that fishes have been given. It's the reputation that's poor, not the memory, really, in the case of fishes. 
This is a little fish called the frillfin goby, and what they do is they live in tide pools. So they live in that intertidal zone. Uh, it looks a bit like this, their habitat. And it'd been noticed over the decades that, that people had noticed that these fishes sometimes jump from one tide pool to another quite accurately, and they can actually work their way out to the open sea. An octopus comes lurking, or a heron, perhaps they want to get out of there. The question is, how do they know which way to jump and how far? How do they know how to avoid making a leap of faith? And a series of careful captive studies and experiments done in New York City, of all places, from the 1940s to the 1970s, determined that they actually memorize the tide pool zone at high tide. So when the water comes in, they swim over it, they swim down among the nooks and crannies, and they form what's called, scientists call a mental map of this surrounding. And using that memory, they can work their way out if they need to. Um, one other point, point about that, if you don't mind going back, thanks. They can memorize the tide pool zone in one day, and they can memorize it, and they can remember it at least 40 days later. That was the other thing I wanted to say. Thank you. Another form of memory uh, it relates to recognition and face recognition. For a long time, aquarium enthusiasts have claimed that their little fish recognizes them, that there can be a group, in the, a group of humans in the room, and the fish takes no interest. And then when I come out, because I'm the one who feeds them, they come over. So there's a lot of anecdotes. But now a research team from Germany, published in 2016, uh, has shown that uh, archer fishes, in this case, recognize us by our faces. They trained archfishes to squirt. You can see the little panel on the right here. To squirt water, it's a nice feature for doing behavioral studies because they can give a very unambiguous vote with their accurate squirting. They will squirt water at a familiar face even if it's presented among 40 or more unfamiliar faces. I don't know about you, but these faces all look pretty similar to me. Those are pretty challenging. The ones on the left are with, not with the hair removed, and the ones on the right, even more cues removed. They've taken the ears away and yet these fishes are able to remember and recognize these different faces. A very recent study also finds that fishes have the inversion, face inversion effect. That is to say that they um, struggle to recognize a familiar face if it's turned upside down. We also have the face inversion effect. Chimpanzees do not. Chimpanzees are very good at recognizing upside down faces. And if you look at their biology, you can see why that might be. What about a little about the psychology of fishes? I think I've only got one example here that I want to give you, but it's a really telling one thing. This is a striated surgeon fish, and a study done by researchers at the University of Lisbon a few years ago involved catching about, I think they took 32 from the Great Barrier Reef, 32 adult striated surgeon fishes, and then they stressed them further, being caught taken captive is probably stressful enough. And then they stress them further by putting them individually in a, in a shallow bucket of water for 30 minutes. You can measure stress in a fish by drawing a bit of blood from the tail vein and seeing what the cortisol level is. And the cortisol levels were very high in these stressed fishes. Uh, keep going. Thanks. And then they, they chose one of two treatments for each individual fish. So one, an individually stressed fish would be put in a tank with a model on the right here, a model of a cleaner fish. I'm going to get to cleaner fishes in a little bit, but suffice to say, they, they, in nature, they provide massages. They provide little, little belly rubs, if you like, to other fishes. And uh, you can stay on that slide, actually, if you don't mind. It's probably my hand here. Yeah, stay on this one for a bit. I've got a bit to describe here with this one. So what they did was, individually, the individually stressed fishes were put in a tank, and the tank had one of these models, a realistic model of a cleaner fish, and it was either attached to a motor, so it would sweep back and forth, as in the top image on the left, or it was stationary. It didn't have a motor, it just stayed still. And if a stressed surgeon fish was put into the tank on the top, that surgeon fish swam up to that model and got stroked with a huge surface on the side, repeatedly. In fact, you know, scientists have to measure stuff, so they averaged 15 visits to this moving wand over the course of an hour. They did two-hour sessions for each individual fish. On the bottom case, where the model was not moving and could not deliver any strokes, they visited zero times. They didn't go up to that thing because it wasn't moving. It couldn't give them any strokes. It didn't do what they wanted it to do. And the ones on the top, their stress levels, their cortisol levels came down. And the ones on the bottom situation, their cortisol levels stayed up. So this study, to sort of to sum it up, it shows that uh, a fish, a surgeon fish in this case, will seek relief of stress 
by getting a massage, a little bit like what we will do, kind of therapeutic use of a stimulus. This is, I don't know about you, this is not the kind of thing that we generally associate fishes doing, is going to a massage therapist to get relief, and yet we have scientific studies that show that they will do this sort of behavior. And I'm just happy to say that the scientists reported in their published article on this, which I think was in Nature, which is a, a prestigious journal, that they returned these surgeon fishes to their original locations and they released them. It's very rare that scientists do that, let alone report it in, in journals, so I was pleased to have a, that it had a bit of a happy ending. Another study released from, uh, uh, done from in Norway talked about the phenomenon of dropouts. This is an industry term for fishes who are in aquaculture operations and they cannot cope with the stresses, the crowding, the, the filth, the parasites who flourish in these crowded conditions, uh, the competition for food, and they, they fail to thrive and they die. The salmon on the bottom, the young salmon, is the same age as the one on the top in this image, but the one on the bottom is one of these dropouts. It's a very widespread problem, and that salmon has just un been able to, unable to keep cope and has stopped eating and has floated to the surface and died. And the research team, you can find the cortisol levels that are very, very high in these individuals, and the research team con concluded that these uh, dropouts are severely depressed. Uh, just a generation ago, you would never find a scientist calling a fish severely depressed in a peer-reviewed journal. Now we have that. So I think that's an indicator that attitudes are changing, including among scientists, and that's really saying something. Fishes show personalities. Uh, people who've kept them as, as pets or companions will, will vouch for that. This is Mango, a nine-year-old pufferfish. That's the one on the left. And. Uh, the human who lives with Mango, the one on the right, sent me this photo, and she's had Mango for nine years, and they they have formed quite a bond, and she says, whenever I get home from work, Mango comes up to the glass, and we sort of have these, she called them staring contests. It looks like a, a love fest to me, but um, in any event, there's a real connection there. We can really relate to puffer fishes because they have their eyes oriented on the front of their faces. That's not, no coincidence that a puffer fish appears on the cover of my book. You know, we, the, the goal, part of the goal of this is to get people to relate, to relate to fishes more than we usually do, and they have enough disadvantages with being cold-blooded and not blinking and that sort of thing. So, um, But anyway, we don't have to rely on anecdotes to appreciate the personality of, of fishes. A recent study found that guppies, which is the smallest of the three animals in this picture, this tiny little one on the bottom left, that guppies have distinctive personality traits is reflected to how they respond to scary situations such as having a fake heron, heron's beak put in the water, or a, a picture of a large predatory fish nearby. Um, they would react differently and they were consistent through time in how they would react. These are the hallmarks of a personality type. A little bit about fish communication. Communication, how we exchange information, is a good window into the inner lives of animals. This is um, an example of referential communication between species, and that is a phenomenon that is pretty highly regarded among scientists as a cogn in terms of its cognitive requirements, and it is vanishingly rare in, in, hum in nature to find this. So what's going on here? This is a still photograph from a, a YouTube video, and you can watch this and many of the things I'm talking about on YouTube, which is my favorite internet page. I don't know about you. Um, there's two species in this rather poor quality image. There's a grouper in the background, a large chunky predatory fish of reefs, and then there's a moray eel in the center foreground. I don't have a laser pointer, but you can see the moray eel poking his, his or her head to the left out of the rock. Just after this photo was taken, the, the grouper swims over the moray eel and does a head shake. Sometimes they do a little body swim. And that is a signal to the moray eel, which essentially translates to Mrs. Moray Eel, will you come hunting with me? And if Mrs. Moray Eel is in the mood, then out they swim together. And you can watch plenty of YouTube videos that have been filmed by amateur and professional photographers showing these two different species swimming like a couple of Disney characters across the reef to go foraging together. Careful observational studies find that their success rate when they forage together is up to five times what it is if they forage independently. Why is that? Because their hunting styles are complementary. The Moray eel is like a ferret. It's slender, can go into the matrix of the reef, can chase a, a poor little target fish in there. And if the fish 
gets caught by the moray, the moray eats the fish. But if the fish escapes out into open water, you know who's waiting, the big, rapid, fast-swimming, chunky grouper. So they do very well when they collaborate. Captive studies at Cambridge University with laminated moray eels, not real ones, that were, could be controlled by a pulley system by the scientists found that groupers are n not just mindless about who they choose to forage with. They will choose moray eels who are more cooperative. A moray eel who retreats back into the, into the, into the uh, burrow when the grouper signals and makes the invitation with the head shake, uh, they won't be solicited for cooperation the next day. They will rather go for, for a moray eel who will work with them. So the chances are on these reefs in the wild where they work together, these uh, groupers know the mo no specific moray eel partners and vice versa. A um, British science writer, Ed Young, sums it up with a, a, a jingle that may be familiar to some of you. If you don't have a pole and your prey's in a hole, fetch a moray. Can fishes be artists? Can they do, do they have a sense of aesthetic appreciation? We, we see examples in nature, particularly birds, who have bright plumages to attract mates. And certainly fishes are very brilliantly colored for various reasons, but some of, the, some of this may be actually to attract a mate. So here's an example that some of you may have seen. This has gotten quite a lot of press. The BBC has since filmed this since it was first discovered. A Japanese diver was diving off the coast of southern Japan some years ago, about five years ago, and discovered one of these, a six foot wide mandala-like crop circle in the bottom of the ocean, about 80 feet down. No idea what it was, set up a camera, and um, eventually it was ascertained that it was a four inch long puffer fish, a species pre previously undescribed to science, unknown to science, a male of this species who spends hours and days building and maintaining this beautiful circular structure in the sand. Next picture. He swims back and forth, fluttering his fins. Hands up if you've seen the YouTube video of this narrated by David Attenborough. I think there's about four people who aren't putting their hands up. So no, there's about 50-50 there. So that, that's great that you've seen this. It's, it's lovely that um, this kind of information is, is so accessible nowadays. I think that that's a, has good, a good omen for animals and our relationship to them. Uh, next slide. So, so this structure, of course, is an attraction. It's the peacock's tail of, of the fish world. It's a device that a male uses to probably, to put it in Darwinian terms, to advertise his fitness, his reproductive fitness, his, um, his Darwinian fitness. Uh, if, if a male can get by and get what he needs for his survival and do this at the same time, he must be pretty fit. So he might be a good candidate to, to mate with. So the couple will mate in here if he's successful, and um, they'll lay, she'll lay her eggs in the bottom, and they will break up little shells and drop them over there and sort of arrange the furniture and make it look, it's not to look nice, it's probably to hide the, the eggs. I have to say I'm, I'm puzzled. I don't know why it's effective, because to me it looks like a big, a big advertisement, like the McDonald's sign we saw earlier. Fish eggs, come and get them here. This is where they are. It's like, why does it work? I don't know. It obviously works to attract a female, but in the case of the bowerbird, she goes off and surreptitiously builds a, a, a private nest somewhere else. It's hard to find. They don't actually nest in the, in the bower. But in this case, these fishes nest and have their eggs in these mandalas. But nonetheless, it's a beautiful example of artistic appreciation in fishes. Here's a couple of subjects that are often not associated with animals. I think it's important that we do associate them. There's plenty of examples in nature of virtuous behavior and pleasurable behavior, behavior in which animals are clearly seeking pleasure. The, the massage-seeking surgeon fishes we saw earlier would be an example of the latter. So here's an example of virtue among fishes. Another recent example, just published a couple of years ago, and it involves rabbit fishes. These are colorful yellow, black, white fishes of reefs. There's many species. There's four indicated here in each quadrant of the slide. This is a photo from the published study. And you can see that in each case, one fish is head down in the reef, foraging for algae, which is what they do. They pluck algae off the corals. And the other individual is face up, head up. The one facing up is playing the lookout. And that lookout is watching out for that moray eel grouper combination or some other predator who might be a risk to either of them. While the other one is in a very vulnerable position, head down in the reef, not able to see much, and, and foraging. And so the lookout is 
displaying virtuous behavior in the sense that it's delayed gratification because he or she is not feeding. They're foregoing food for the time being while the other one forages safely. And if trouble comes, the one facing up will signal and they will both flee into the reef to hide. Of course, as you can sure imagine, they change places every few minutes. So the one who's been foraging comes up and plays lookout while the one who's been looking out goes down to feed. So they both get to eat more safely through time thanks to this uh, give and take, this reciprocal virtuous behavior. This is a still photograph of a phenomenon in fishes that is not just one of the most sophisticated social symbiotic networks, structures in, in animal behavior or in fish behavior, but in, in nature, completely in nature. It's, um, it's so-called the cleaner stations, cleaner fish stations that occur mostly on reefs. And so what's going on here is we have a, a client fish. They don't call themselves that, we call them that. Um, and there's a, more than 100 known species of client fishes who will line up to wait their turn to be serviced by cleaner fishes, of which you see two here. They typically work in pairs or trios as a team. And um, you can see the cooperation in this photo. I love this photo because it really does illustrate it. The client, the puffer fish, is opening his or her mouth to let this cleaner into the mouth. By the way, there's been, never been any, any um, observation of a client eating a cleaner, even though clients are often much larger predatory fishes and they could eat their cleaners. It's just not a good way to sustain good business relations to eat your business partner. And you can see the other cleaners coming out of the gills, so the gill covers are opened. What are they doing? They're removing parasites primarily. They may remove algae, sloughing skin, and other such undesirables. So you can see the mutualism here. The cleaners get food, and they may service over 2,000 clients in one day. They're very busy. And the clients get a parasite removal service and a spa treatment. But it is complex. There's over 150 pa published papers on, on this phenomenon so far, and there's new stuff coming out all the time. It does get Machiavellian. Cleaners sometimes don't do such a good job. They may do what's called mucus nipping. It's when they take a moat of that slimy layer on the outside of the client fish. Uh, it's very nutritious and apparently tasty, and they like it. And careful observational studies find that cleaners are much less likely to mucus nip if there's a big queue of clients waiting their turn to come to this cleaning station. They're much more likely to do a shoddy job if there's one or fewer clients in the queue. Why? Presumably because their eBay ratings are not going to go down as much if there's nobody watching what their reputation is. So it's essentially an awareness of maintaining a reputation and, and keeping that reputation up and not losing that reputation to clients who may see what's going on and may say, I'm not going to these cleaners and going somewhere else. These cleaners, like the moray eel grouper combination, they, they know their clients, and the clients are trusted customers. So these are long-term relationships, and they're built on trust, and sometimes that trust is violated. So it's pretty complicated. And, and I can't claim credit for the phrase Machiavellian in this context, because a, a fish researcher from Switzerland was the first one to coin it in, in a paper on Machiavellian intelligence in fishes. And as we might, we might not be too surprised to see this kind of phenomenon. We've already seen how surgeon fishes will seek strokes to get um, stress relief. And I've, I forgot to mention one other thing about the last slide, and that is that cleaners will sometimes take a break from plucking parasites, and they will swim, swim onto the side of the client, and they will flutter their pectoral fins against them. They're giving them a massage. They're giving them a little. Uh, tickle or massage, and um, the, the client's fish, probably their stress comes down. And I, I, my, I suspect that's a way to mollify the client who might be a little uh, disgruntled that they just had a piece of mucus nipped off of their bodies. And it's also signaling to other clients in the queue that, hey, um, you know, we, we do good service here. We not, we're not only going to remove your parasites, we're going to give you a massage to boot. So here we have a phenomenon where we have, in this case, a Nassau grouper swimming up to a trusted human to get strokes. Uh, there's no food exchange here. This is uh, simply the pleasure of touch. So I think this relates to the, the pleasure that I mentioned earlier. Next slide. And I gave a talk on this subject to a vet school in Kansas a couple of years ago, and one of the students came up to me afterwards and said, oh, yeah, we, we pet this NASA grouper in the, in the Caymans every year when my dad and I died there. So uh, she said, I'll send you some photos. So here are three photos from that visit. Here she is petting this beautiful fish. Uh, and here she is mugging for the camera. 
And uh, this is her father with his regulator under the flared operculum, that's the gill cover of this same grouper, and the bubbles are caressing, and presumably it feels good, caressing over that sensitive uh, respiratory gill tissue under the gill cover. Okay, so that's, that's, there's much more that can be said, and there are many more examples in, in my book, but uh, I hope that's a helpful overview of what fishes are capable of. I think a good way to sum it up is that there really isn't anything that a mammal can do, and we hold mammals in high regard. We think of them as the highest vertebrates. It's just our own tendency to want to categorize and hierarchicalize things. It's a human thing. We, we think of them as up there. Well, there's nothing really that mammals do that fishes don't. There's, a, there's at least one example among fishes of, of, of what mammals are, are known to be able to do. So we've really, really underestimated them. And it may be because of a couple of things I mentioned earlier, the, the, the fact that they're cold-blooded, they have those staring eyes, they don't blink, they don't need to, their eyes are permanently bathed in water, they don't need to evolve uh, eyelids. They make all kinds of sounds, and there's many fishes, uh, grunts and croakers and toad fishes that are named for the sounds that they make under the water, but just as if we stick our head under the water and shout and yell and scream, it won't be very effective. Uh, for air listeners, similarly, their sounds are ma mainly evolved for underwater. We rarely hear what they're saying. So they've had this disadvantage, and I think that may maybe plays some role in how we've been alienated from them and we've, we've treated them rather poorly. Their habitats are beleaguered, and this is not a new theme in this conference. Uh, I don't know if you've seen some of the films here, but um, they've really, they've really shown us some of, the, um, some of the, the ways that human activity in the Anthropocene is impacting fishes and their living spaces. We have climate change, the warming of the oceans. But you only got five minutes? That's okay, I think I'm doing all right for time here. And uh, we have rising acid layers. The oceans are actually basic, they're alkaline, but they're becoming less alkaline, which is a, 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 another way of saying acidification. Coral bleaching is a phenomenon you've probably heard of where corals are losing their integrity. The uh, symbiosis with the, um, the, the, the coral polyps and the algae is being broken down and the corals are expelling the algae and leaving them, them white and compromised. And we have ocean fishing gear, ocean waste, plastic waste, but uh, fishing gear alone has been estimated to amount to 640,000 tons a year is uh, left or discarded in the oceans, and a lot of that fishing gear continues to wreak havoc on wildlife. Ocean plastic is an insidious problem. The production of plastics creates microbeads, of which there are, up, there are quintillions in some of the seaways in the world, huge numbers, and they look just like fish eggs, which is a, a very important food source for some young predatory fishes, so they ingest them, they cannot, they cannot assimilate them, and their, their stomachs eventually rupture and they, they die from that. So that's another problem. And of course, the basic thing, that we're just hauling a lot of fishes out of the water. The limit on how many we take today is not according to our effort, it's really according to um, how many are, are left. There's just not enough fishes to meet our insatiable demand. Thank you. This is a, f a depiction of bycatch, which is um, one of the ugliest words in the English language. Bycatch refers to uh, non-targeted, unwanted fishes or sea, cr sea creatures, marine life, that is nevertheless caught in the fishing gear, dumped on the deck, and uh, historically, typically dumped over, dead or dying. There is a trend where fisheries are keeping more bycatch to try and sell as pet food or other, other things, uh, but it, it's still a terrible, terribly wasteful byproduct of fishing. And uh, an estimate, another statistic I can give you, it's been estimated that we dump about 200 million pounds of bycatch into the oceans every day, back into the water. And not surprisingly, with these kinds of figures and this kind of interaction with ocean life and their habitats, is we see, we've seen huge declines, measurable declines in marine life. This is a, st a statistic that was published uh, just in 2015. And if you know anything about the history of commercial fishing, you'll know that the marine extinctions and a lot of marine life has been lost before 1970. We might sum up this kind of relationship with the phrase, might makes right. If you have the strength to 
take and to exploit, then it's okay to do so. And we have a long, humans have a long history of might makes right behavior, colonialism, the African slave trade, the denial of voting rights to women, the denial of civil rights to people of color, this sort of thing. Uh, these are manifestations of might makes right. Uh, happily, we've relegated a lot of these past ills to the history books. There's still imbalances that need to be addressed, but nevertheless, we've made progress, and cultural change happens a lot faster than evolutionary change, and that's a promising thing. And we can credit some scientists, such as these two I'm going to present to you. They are white males, but history has tended to favor white males just for sociological reasons, not for ethical reasons, unfortunately. Um, this is Charles Darwin on the left, whose theory of evolution by natural selection, which is not really a theory anymore. It's pretty much biological fact, or certainly a principle of biology, um, finally linked us humans to the other animals biologically. And then the gentleman on the right, less known individual, but a, a very important 20th century American biologist named Donald Griffin, he started writing books about how animals think. And uh, in, in the mid-1970s, he wrote three or four books about that subject, like Animal Minds. And uh, that really got going the new field, subdiscipline of my field, ethology, of cognitive ethology, which looks at how animals think and feel, how they experience the world. And I think we really need to appreciate that they experience their world, to know that they're sentient, to really relate to them empathically and compassionately, and realize that their lives are as meaningful to them as ours are to us, and that their, a mouse's pain is as realistic to a mouse as our pain is to us. And coincidentally, right around the same time that Donald Griffin was having an impact on with cognitive ethology, we had the rise of philosophers such as Peter Singer, who, as some of you know, spoke at this conference earlier on by Skype, and Tom Reagan, who, while he's unable to be here for obvious reasons, nevertheless has been a presence through are honoring his recent passing. Uh, these individuals have helped to put animals on the moral stage in a way that wasn't happening ever before. So we are in exciting times where there's great potential for change, and um, we just need to keep moving in the right direction, uh, hopefully faster than we have been. And so perhaps not surprisingly with these recent trends with uh, acknowledging animal cognition and the rights of animals, the animals as, as ethical beings, as, as, as subjects of moral concern and consideration, we are witnessing an unprecedented level of ethical concern for animals. And let me just finish up with a few examples of how humans are helping animals or fishing, particularly. Shark stroking is a growing pastime of some professionals, such as uh, Christina Zanato on the left here, who I interviewed for my book. She's, um, she's a quite, she's something of a shark petting celebrity, and she's a shark protector, a growing number of shark protectors. You can watch wonderful videos of 10-foot tiger sharks swimming up to divers to have their faces rubbed, and they're, they're blinking their eyes, and they're, you know, they're, they're behaving in a, a way completely at odds with the with the cultural angst-ridden way that we tend to present tiger sharks. And we have divers who are removing hooks, fishing hooks from fish's faces, such as this blue shark who swam up to be close to these divers and hung around with them. And a growing number of divers are taking bolt cutters and other equipment down that they can remove hooks from fish's mouths. You may have seen YouTube videos of um, couple of puffer fishes, for instance, who are being rescued by divers, not from a fishing hook, but from a net. And uh, a, few, a few minutes after this photo was taken, this fish was relieved of his or her large fishing hook that was embedded in the mouth. I'm sure you can see it, with a long piece of filament trailing behind. And the shark, the blue shark, remained among the divers for some minutes after this was done. Is it gratitude? We, we, we think that Whales are showing gratitude sometimes, and you can see videos of that. Um, we should not discount the possibility that a shark, long-lived, large-brained marine creature, uh, can feel gratitude. Uh, the, the, the jury isn't out anymore that fishes are capable of emotions. Thank you. This is a particular case where you have a scientist, in this case, um, I'm not remembering his name right now, but um, he's a friend of mine, Mike Howell. He's a retired ichthyologist from the University of Alabama. And he got tired of collecting fishes in jars of chemicals and having them on shelves where they'd just waste away for years. And then he invented this fishing tank, this 
this photographic tank where you could place a fish caught in the field, and here he is with some of his students, into this tank and take fi pictures of it, beautiful de detailed photos. Um, here's the tank with a, an individual fish, and the next slide I think shows an example of a photo, how you can see the beautiful colors and the detail. The fishes are somewhat immobilized in their native water, and then once you've taken your photo, you can put the fishes back in their habitat. And uh, thousands of these devices have been sold so far, and he, th he thinks uh, at least a million fishes have been spared uh, being dropped into preservative by having this device available. But of course, the biggest impact, negative impact we have on animals is our decision to eat them. Almost all of the fishes we kill, as with all, almost all of the animals we kill, are to be eating them. And so to that end, it's exciting that we're now seeing some new technologies coming up that may give people who continue to eat marine life uh, another option to not eat them. We have plant-based seafood, such as made by New Wave Foods, based in California. I visited their office last year. And they have already uh, got their shrimp, their plant-based shrimp is now being purchased by food distributors and will become retail later this year. Thank you. And another company, next slide, Finless Foods, is developing uh, in vitro or clean meat type uh, fish products, seafood products. So this is made with actual fish tissue, but it isn't, uh, there was never a fish, there was never a hook, there was never a net. Uh, there was never all of the ills of aquaculture and or commercial fishing at sea. So it's a way to provide another option for consumers that they can continue to have their fish and we can continue to have our fish and eat them too without harming them. So these are exciting technologies that are, that are coming down the pike, pardon the pun, and um, these are uh, ways that we can improve our relationship to these animals. And I'll finish with a quote from Sylvia Earle, who's a, an, an oceanographer, a celebrated oceanographer, winner of the TED Prize, sort of the Jane Goodall of the oceans, if you like. I'm not going to read it for you. You can all read. And I like the sentiments here. And I think what she said doesn't need to apply just to a grouper. Certainly, we, we, we have good reasons to appreciate groupers. But I think uh, zebra fishes and puffer fishes and guppies and rice fishes, and the list goes on. There's over 33,000 species. They all qualify for our moral concern and respect. And I think um, we, if we respect animals as having lives that are, as va that are valuable to them, that they don't just have bio bio biologies, but they have biographies, uh, that's a better world for them. And that's the kind of world I'd like to live in. Thanks very much. some time for questions. Um, I would like to, if you can raise your hand so we can assign numbers. One. Okay. Thank you for, thanks for the talk, Jonathan. Uh, after reading your book and seeing your talk today, I, I had the impression uh, that uh, we, were, we were looking for fish sentience uh, in the wrong place with the fish pain debate, mm. because you showed in your book, uh, even summarizing the fish pain debate, that they they feel pain in a different way than, than the other mammals, because this is, a, as far as I understand, an evolutionary uh, need. Uh, but their subjectivity lies somewhere else in all these features that, that you have shown. So I, I'd like to hear you a bit more ab about uh, this fish pain debate their sentience and their subjectivity. Thanks. Thank you for that question. And I, I'm realizing now uh, that I overlooked the, the pain issue. I, I, I mentioned it in a pa panel the other day, but I didn't include it in today's presentation. And I usually do include it in a variation on this talk. So let me just briefly summarize what I think is the most compelling study design that shows pain in fishes. I mean, just at the outset, let me say that in my view, and in a growing number of scientists' view, we, we needn't be having this debate because it should be pretty obvious by now that fishes are feel pain, that they're sentient. Uh, nevertheless, a study was published a couple of years ago by Lynn Snedden, who was going to be here and couldn't make it, in which she, and apologies to those in the audience who already heard me describe this the other day, but I think most of the people here haven't. Um, she, they had zebra fishes, 30 or so, in a complex tank that had two chambers, 
One was a barren chamber, or not barren chamber, a dimly lit chamber with places to hide, rocks, vegetation. Um, that's the kind of place that little fishes like to, like to be because they feel safer there. But they could also, if they wished, they could swim across to another part of the tank that was barren and brightly lit. It's the kind of place that little fishes do not like to go. And sure enough, almost pretty much all the time, 100% of the time, the zebra fishes spent all of their time in this side of the tank. And then some of them were injected with acid, presumably painful and lasting pain. And then some of them were injected at the same time with saline, uh, presumably non-lasting painful stimulus. They all remained pretty much in this side of the tank. Very rarely did anyone go anywhere near this side until the scientists dissolved a painkiller, lidocaine in this case, into this side of the chamber. And some of the fishes started to swim across to that side and stay there for a while. And you may guess it was only the ones who'd received the acid injection. So not only are the fishes showing the wherewithal to take action to relieve their pain, but they're willing to pay a cost to relieve it. They're willing to go to a place that they feel scared normally. Uh, they don't like it there, but at least I get pain relief. So. You know, I think we can really relate to this. I think it's a pretty compelling demonstration of pain perception in a fish. And I like to think that you know, it would be nice if we could just pack it all in now. We don't have to do any more pain studies. Clearly, these animals, and I think it's safe to say that zebra fishes are pretty reasonable representatives of, of, of certainly bony fishes. Nevertheless, there'll be more studies like this, and there will be plenty. There'll be pl plenty of people who continue to deny that fishes feel pain, but it's really becoming hard to deny it. And um, one other thing I'll mention is the ju a journal that I'm a co-editor of. It's called Animal Sentience. It's an online journal, and there's been a quite a, a rich discussion about this very issue on that journal, and I encourage you to check that out. Thank you. Yes? Hi, Jonathan. Your talk was so interesting, and um, I haven't read your book yet, but I want to ask you, um, for, from your pers uh, point of view, what would you say to someone? For me, it's so hard to see fish in these small boxes. So what would you say to people uh, who has fishes and who loves to see fishes inside to not to take uh, this, not, not, not happen this again, not, not making this happen again. Don't buy fishes and that's, what's your yeah, th for thank that. you for that question, Elizabeth. And that's another issue that I did not mention. It's, it's another big issue: fish pain and aquarium keeping. Uh, the aquarium trade is a is a big industry, and that's kind of where I focus it. People who keep fishes in in aquariums, they're well-meaning. They don't want to harm their fishes usually, but um, there's a whole dark side of that whole industry. The the, the aquarium trade is a very rapacious trade. Uh, millions and millions of fishes are taken from reefs, usually reef habitats, every year because they're pretty. And uh, the, the, the methods used to catch them, cyanide poisoning, explosives sometimes, are, are cause harm and death to many fishes who don't make it. And then the shipping causes a lot more deaths. Uh, Europe, Japan, and the United States are the leading consumers of, this, of these products. It's been estimated that w one in 10 fish makes it to destination, and one in 10 of those who survive all of that is still living a, a year later uh, in someone's aquarium. So. Uh, it causes a lot of mortality and a lot of suffering and uh, noticeable declines in native populations in the areas that they're taken from. So I, I usually mention that to people uh, after saying, you know, I appreciate that you appreciate fishes aesthetically and I agree that they're beautiful to watch, but here's the problem with this and people need to be educated about that issue. Someone else? Yes. Jonathan. Hi, Carlos. Uh, what do you think uh, that we can do, uh, like activists to animal rights, to fight with the hunting of foreign species introduced by humans is in some oceans, uh, like in the Atlantic Ocean with the lionfish, with defense of uh, environmental arguments? Yes. Uh, so you're referring specifically to um, invasive or, or non-native species that have been uh, put there? Yes, uh, the lionfish is a great example. Um, this is one of those dilemmas. You know, these, these are creatures who have ended up in parts of the waterways that they don't really belong, and they, they, they are pre predatory, and they can really have a big impact on native species. So my, my, my response is not that we should throw our hands in the air and do nothing, necessarily, but certainly I think we need to lead, lead with ethics and compassion and, and recognize that species do not suffer. It's individuals who suffer. 
and a lionfish is presumably no less sensitive to pain than any other fish. And so we have to include that into the equation when we come up with policies as to how to address. That's not really giving the answer in terms of what we should do. Uh, that's, that's tricky and challenging. But we must always consider the, the, the needs of an individual and not just the needs of species in making those decisions. So I hope that's helpful. Okay, do we have another question? Yes. What do we say to people who engage in catch and release? Or, you know, fly fishing is so very, very popular. And that's often done catch and release, so. Thanks, Leslie. I, I've never understood with fly fishing why people are interested in trying to catch flies. I, I don't understand. Um, but seriously, uh, some, some of my colleagues in the movement call it maim and release, not catch and release, because it does, typ typically that fish, by the time he or she's released back into the water, has certainly been handled, often been fought on the line for sometimes an hour or more. Uh, they're exhausted. One study found almost a 100% mortality rate of billfish. These are the big marlins and swordfish by the time they got to the boat side, just from the, the struggle, that struggle, a desperate struggle to get away. Suffice, and then there's the handling, which removes a lot of that, that protective mucus layer that I mentioned in the cleaner fish client interactions. But that plays an important role in preventing diseases and fungus infections and such. And so there's a lot of harm that goes on to fishes before they're released back. Germany has actually banned catch and release com uh, fishing competitions for the very reason that the, the, the handling causes, causes harm to them. Um, so, oh, oh yes, there was one other thing I wanted to mention. There's been some studies where fishes have been kept in underwater cages for observation for three or four days after being caught and released and have shown empirically that mortality rates are much higher than fishes who have not been handled and, and not been caught on the line So during those first three or four days. And disease rates are much higher as well. So it's known that it's harmful. And it's, uh, you know, I, I guess if I was a fish and I was had the choice between being caught and released or being caught and killed and eaten, I would choose the first option. But it, it wouldn't be an, opt an optimal option. So there's definitely problems with it. Thank you. I think we have a question over there. I have a, a question on your position on um, the usage of fish in scientific experiments. Could you speak a little louder? Bit louder? Uh, I heard uh, you, but I just uh, uh, my my you. question is yes. on on the on the use of fishes in yeah. in in research. What's your position on that? What do you think about um, taking fishes out of the sea, containing them, stressing them voluntarily? What's what's your position? Sure. On that? Uh, well, as you can probably guess but by my approach to animals, I'm not in favor of any kind of scientific investigation that causes harm. And I do cite studies that cause harm. The pain study I just described, the stress study, uh, and some other ones that I described in the book as well. Uh, I do take a pragmatic approach that if somebody else has harmed a fish and found some interesting information, uh, I would rather, I think, I like to think that it may help the fish in the long run if I, if I share the information and maybe people become more enlightened and we're less likely to do that in future. Um, but certainly, um, I, I, I think we need to be mindful of the, uh, as I said earlier, the, the sentience of individual fishes. Most of the ones used in laboratory experiments these days are captive, uh, reared, and bred. Uh, fewer in, are caught in the wild, which is, which is a, a, a positive thing. But once again, from the perspective of the individual, it's, it's not really any different. Uh, zebra fishes are now getting close to being the most commonly used vertebrate animal in research. They're, they're getting up close to mice. They may have even passed them. So uh, it's considered a refinement in the industry to use a fish because they don't suffer as much. They're more primitive, lower, cold-blooded animals. That's the kind of bias that we've had. And that's, that's very entrenched, as you probably know. Uh, I don't think that's a viable reason to use more fish in research. It's no better based on what we now know about them. They're just as complex. They're just as conscious, just as aware. So um, we shouldn't think, be thinking that way. Nevertheless, it's, it's widespread, and the numbers are not going down yet for fishes. And hopefully that will, the tide will turn soon. Um, you said that many fish that are bought as pets don't survive for very long. Correct. And I went to a session earlier in this conference um, about exotic pets and um, just people not knowing that um, salamanders or, or lizards need calcium and, and so and you said that more education needs to happen and I'm wondering where and when and how do you think that education is best delivered 
That's a big question. I write, I write my books and I give talks because for that very reason, to educate the public and enlighten people. Uh, you know, decisions are always better if they're informed decisions, and so we, we have to have ways to get the information out. There's so many reforms that need to happen in, in our education system. You know, the, the, uh, the, way, the things that we're, we're taught, we're not taught life skills. There's so many things we're not taught in schools, and I admire teachers for the hard work they do, but we need new curricula that teach respect for animals, that teach you what taxation is, that teach you some, some life skills that we just don't get currently in our schooling. I know I could have used it, uh, and certainly ethical to, uh, ethics towards animals is, is key. Yeah, it's, it's not better, just better for the animals if we have ethical education. It's better for society, right? I believe in karma. You know, what goes around comes around. A more compassionate society towards animals is a more compassionate society. So that's a very broad answer, but it was a broad question and a tough one. Um, but uh, we definitely need a lot of reforms in our education system, and I, and I think the schools is, is an important part of that. Obviously, parenting is, is important, is a great responsibility as well. Okay, we have a question over there. And Hi, thanks a lot for a very fascinating talk. Um, I wanted to ask you if, if you could give us a bit more information about octopus. We hear and we read like really amazing stuff about octopus. Um, and yet they eat them everywhere, yes. fast food. Yes, indeed. Thank you for raising that. Um, because my book is, is specifically about fishes, I don't address marine invertebrates such as octopuses. Uh, but there's some great books about them, The Soul of an Octopus, Other Minds are two great examples that have come out recently. And octopuses are, are I love what they're doing. I love, I love the way they're affecting us because as we learn about them and begin to celebrate them, we, we realize that once again that we've sold animals so short. We've always had this big line between the vertebrates, the backbone ones, and the invertebrates. Octopuses, of course, being invertebrates. And yet now the, the science is showing, you know, hammering away, showing these are conscious, aware, emotional, flexible, intelligent, crafty, deceiving, grudge-holding creatures. I mean, they're really, really, there's great anecdotes and there's really good science on them. And um, I love the way um, the author of Other Minds puts it. It's essentially like an octopus is essentially, it evolved consciousness separately from the lineage that led to vertebrates. So we're talking about an alien. It's like, it's the closest we can get to, and I think someone said this earlier in this meeting, it's the closest we can get to meeting and interacting with a, a species from another planet. And I do recommend a video that I recommended to at least two of my fellow confreys uh, earlier this week. If you haven't seen the, the YouTube video series called um, True Facts About the Octopus, or there's True Facts About the Naked Mole Rat, True Facts About the, <laughs> um, the Tapir, they're really, really good. It's really great footage, nice classical music in the background, and the narration is a little bit irreverent, uh, hilarious sometimes, and very informative. So I recommend True Facts About the Octopus, or True facts about the octopus sounds a little bit more like he says it. He's very funny, this guy Z Frank. It's a great way to learn about octopuses and laugh at the same time. Okay, we have just the last question. Well, it was more like a response to that question over there that I'm a veterinarian from the Netherlands and I'm very disappointed over the years about uh, the, the lack of, of uh, support by animal protection organizations dealing with the welfare of animals that are kept as companion animals. They're focusing, for good reasons, on our farm industry animals, trade of horses and cows, for very good reasons. But it's very amazing that most of those organizations are founded and members are having companion animals. And in my experience as veterinarians, millions and millions of those animals are kept by kept as companion animals, the owners, members of those organizations suffer because of ignorance, lack of information about their physical condition and the needs of companion animals. And it's struggling, I'm struggling with that all the time, that those people can have such a huge impact using what we know in their own companion animal uh, scene and get them involved in the animals that are not kept as companion animals. Now we are turning it around all the time, asking companionship for 
fishes, but they mistreat their dog or their parrot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I That's think just that more like a comment, but <laughs> also something I'm really struggling with, uh, uh, animal protection organizations in my country. Yeah, and, and my country as well. There's not a lot being done about that, and it's, and it's back to the education theme. We simply, well, we need, it's not, not a simple issue, but we need to have educational materials. We need to have ways to educate companion animal guardians to know their animals and understand them and provide them with better lives. Well, thank you so much for being here. I apologize in the name of Paulina Rivero Weber, the director of the program of bioethics of this university. She couldn't be here for medical reasons. And thank you to Dr. Jonathan Balcon for this enlightening lecture. I just remind everybody to fill in their uh, uh, pages uh, voting for the best or the selected uh, choice for best uh, presentation, best activist presentation, best poster, etc. So thank you. Um, the next um, event in this room will be the showing of Saving Luna. And uh, this film was shown at all previous Mining Animals Conferences, and um, Mike Parfitt, the uh, producer and director of the film, uh, uh, came to the first conference. He unfortunately couldn't make it uh, to this conference. Uh, you would have all already seen the Beluga film, uh, also made by Mike. Um, but this film is outstanding, um, and it's a repeat performance, and everybody that sees it is ex extremely moved. It's in two. It's not in so much in two parts. We have to break for afternoon. Tea.